We're entering what could be called the golden age of documentaries. Never has there been greater demand in theaters, on television, at film festivals, and even as downloads from iTunes. Also, there's never been greater need for documentaries, with turmoil across the Middle East and wars right here in Central Africa. In fact, in Sudan, where I am right now, there are up to six different conflicts raging from Darfur and Kassala to Equatoria, the Nuba Mountains, and even here in southern Sudan. What we're going to teach you in this lesson is how to shoot world-class digital cinema. Video has become such a commodity that people really don't want to watch it anymore. But with digital cinema, it has that captivating look of a real Hollywood movie. What we're going to show you is how to take a backpack like this and fill it with enough gear to be able to shoot world-class documentaries anywhere by yourself. So the old barrier to shooting movies or world-class documentaries with 35 millimeter film was just cost, staggering amounts of money, up to $13,000 a day. The breakthrough has been with these HD DSLR cameras. They allow you to shoot digital cinema because they have such a, a big chip and because they use such wonderful lenses. A camera like this could cost less than $1,000. You can shoot with it for years as opposed to $13,000 a day, so that gives you some sense of the economics. Now, when I shoot, I always have a checklist because I forget stuff. You forget one thing like the wrong white balance or something and you'll wreck your day. So let's go through how you would set up one of these cameras before you start to shoot. First of all, number one, I have set exposure mode. So on the dial here, I have various uh, programs. I could do uh, aperture, I could do shutter speed, but I want to put it on M. I want to put it on full manual. That gives me complete control over the camera to get the best possible picture. Number two on the checklist is to set a picture profile. As opposed to just having something that looks like sort of garish video, you can actually choose a color profile. Genesis, Marvel, Technicolor, any of the great filmic looks you like, say from a Steven Spielberg movie. So number two, what I do is I choose a picture profile. I've already loaded these in the camera, and I'll dial through here to be able to pick and choose the one that I want. For today, I'm taking Genesis. Gives me a wonderful sort of flat color here and allows me to then use color grading when I go into post. So key here, choose a picture profile as number two. So number three, Pick your color temperature. One of the wonderful things with these cameras is you can either warm up or cool down the look. So for instance, you have a very tragic documentary, you may want a very dark look. Or if it's more bright and optimistic as uh, this one is here uh, in southern Sudan, then you may have a warmer color temperature. And again, you can choose that right here in the menus. So number four, set your frame rate and frame size. I've chosen 24p here, that's what most documentarians use, and that's what's also used in real Hollywood movies. 30 frames a second is what's used in television, and it gets a more of a sort of ordinary and sort of garish look. And I want to have the full 1920 across, so I have that great big, big screen look. Number five is to set your shutter speed. So the key with these cameras is you have to set it at 1 50th of a second. That is roughly double your frame rate, which is 24 frames a second. I'm really locked into that. So I'm going to set this at 50, and then I'm really locked there for the rest of the shoot. Number six, select a lens. One of the great things about these cameras is that you could go out with 10 or 15 different lenses. It gives you lots of different kinds of looks. I'm a big believer in using prime lenses that is just one focal length. And right here, because I'm shooting these individuals at a little bit of a distance to be able to uh, show a little respect for them and not agitate the crowd, I'm using a 200 millimeter lens. Number seven, set your subject's eye line. It's critical where the eye line is. That is, if you're looking up at a camera, it tends to make the person look like they're imposing or an authoritative uh, uh, stature. If they're looking up like this, then it's a little bit more submissive. With a documentary, you're really not looking at moods, so you want to have a straight level eye line. Also, it's important to see where your subject looks. I'm a big believer in having your subject look just slightly off the camera rather than far off. This is sort of a 1980s style. 
This is a much more modern look, and it's almost as if they're looking into the camera. You also want to be very careful that no one's distracting from that eye line. For instance, if a lot of people come close to the camera, I might be looking off this way or this way instead of directly into the lens. Step number eight, set your f-stop. The f-stop, of course, selects the amount of light that goes into the camera, but that's not why we're using f-stop in this particular lesson. The wider that f-stop is, that is, the more open the camera is, the shallower the depth of field. And that's what gives you this crisp, filmic look. So, for instance, I could have focus from my nose here back to my ear, as opposed to having a very deep depth of field where just everything's in focus, which is a, a very kind of garish look. This way, just a little bit in focus, throws the background out of focus and gives me that real filmic look. So I do that by opening this up. The faster the lens, the better you're able to sort of throw the background out of focus. This is an f1.4. However, if you're running and gunning, that is if I'm going to go and follow these kids into a home or a car, then I might select an f-stop like f11 or f16. Puts much, much more into focus so I'm not going to make a mistake. So I can run and gun and I could be a little off the focus mark but still have the shot in focus. Number nine, set your ISO. Wonderful thing about these cameras is you can actually select what your film speed is. In the old days, of course, you'd have to take one roll of film out and then put another roll of film in. So I can go anywhere from uh, 100, which is really my slowest sort of speed, and would give me amazing detail, especially for scenes like this. It's also what I would want in really bright sunlight, since I'm not trying to let a lot of light go into the camera. Now, if it were very dark out here, I could go to 3200, even 6400, to really let lots and lots of light into the camera. But by doing that, I get very kind of grainy look. So number 10 is to select a filter. So I have the ISO I want, 100, because I've got bright sunlight here. I've got the shutter speed I have to have, which is a 50th of a second. And I have uh, the f-stop I want to have a very shallow depth of field, which is 1.4. But as I look through here, I see that it's completely blown out, completely overexposed. So I'm really kind of stuck, unless I have one of these. This is a neutral density filter, but it's variable. So it allows me to screw it on the end of the lens and then I can basically adjust my exposure by just simply twisting this. Very easy way to be able to get exactly the right exposure and critical to be able to get the s-stop you want, the shutter speed you have to have, and to be able to keep the ISO steady so you have a, well, I would say a pretty uh, uniform look throughout your entire film. Number 11 is to compose your shot. The natural tendency with anybody with a camera is to just take and put their, their subject right in the middle of the, the frame, which looks terrible, looks amateurish. What you do want to do is to use what we call the rule of thirds. So as an example, I might be here on the left side of the frame, and my camera's here on the right side of the frame. That gives you a perfectly balanced shot. Very important to use this rule of thirds so you have very nice composition. Also, I like the idea of having kind of a foreground, a middle ground, and a background for, for contrast. So I might have these kids here as a bit of a foreground. I'm the middle ground, and then I have a background there with this wonderful African village. Number 12, stabilize your shot. You know, there's nothing more amateurish than watching a camera kind of jiggle around. What really creates a motion picture look is a very still camera. The amateur takes a camera out of the box and they just want to create motion with it. They move it back and forth, they pan, they zoom, and it really looks terrible. So I stabilize my shot and I like to put it on a tripod if at all possible. These tripods here should have what we call a fluid head. That allows me to pan back and forth or up or down very, very slowly, but it's still giving me a very sort of smooth look. Also, you want to pretend like this camera weighs a thousand pounds, like it's a real film camera. Quick kind of pan like this, looks amateurish, but using it very, very, very slowly is as if I have to move a thousand pound camera. So I can stabilize it with a tripod like this. I have smaller tripods that don't have a fluid head that are much more portable if I'm really trying to run and gun. I might use a monopod. And there are a series of stabilizing devices made by companies like Zacuto that allow you to actually put it on your shoulder like a real TV camera. Number 14, set your white balance. 
So here on the camera, I'm able to press the white balance button. It gives me a variety of different kinds of choices. Now, a real professional would probably measure the actual color temperature, but on the fly, you don't have a chance to do that. So today, it's not quite sunny, it's cloudy, so I'm going to choose cloudy. Here's one of the big reasons to have a checklist. The likelihood is I'd have cloudy set here, go inside, continue shooting, say, with tungsten lighting, and have it look yellow and awful because I forget, forgot to set the white balance. So it's critical any time you move to change the white balance. It could be sunny, it could be cloudy. As you go in stores, you want to be able to select the difference between, say, a phosphorescent light and a tungsten light. Also, when you have a mixed lighting picture, it's very important to decide which light to set your white balance on. I like to set it on the face. So I might actually take a white piece of paper and do a manual white balance by taking a picture of it and letting the camera then calculate what the white balance should be. Number 15 is to set exposure and focus. Now, I'm a very big believer in using a monitor. That allows me to get a very, very precise focus. I'll zoom in 10 times here onto my subject, and then using a, a, a focus puller like this, get an absolutely exact and precise focus. In terms of exposure here, I really want my subject to be right on, especially here in Africa in the tropics. People tend to shoot, the faces are very dark, or the eyes are even sort of uh, blackened out because they terribly underexposed it. So what I do with this monitor is I choose false colors. That allows me to see that a face is, face is pink or green or gray, it's really right kind of where I want to be, probably pink is the best. Then the background could be yellow, it's overexposed, it could be blue, but I want that, I want my subject to be absolutely precisely correct. Now I can use some lighting around that, so if I have a very bright background there and a dark uh, subject, I can use a little bit of light there. But again, by using false colors here, I'll get absolutely precisely the right focus. This is especially important if you're shooting very low light at night. You're allowed to sort of have stuff very underexposed, but you want to, again, have your subject perfectly exposed and view that here on this monitor with what we call false colors. And lastly, get ready for the action. Roll camera and roll sound. I can't believe the number of times people have pushed the button and they're not actually recording. So look for this red light here as I actually press record. And make certain you press record on the sound device as well. With these, I'll often shoot this in advance because uh, you have a tremendous amount of storage on these uh, devices. And then I will roll sound so I'm ready for the big shot. And the big shot is the airplane has just landed here. This is a relief airplane that's come in to pick up this crew here in this uh, war-torn country of Southern Sudan.